lived long enough to see adulthood, know that things do not always turn out as you think they would. They don't always go well. Sometimes life just doesn't. Sometimes life gets a little messy. Amen? Sometimes it is. Most of us have seen enough to recognize that life doesn't always go as planned. Sometimes you don't get that job or the promotion. Sometimes you don't finish school like you planned or you had planned. Sometimes the relationship doesn't work out. Sometimes uh, you get hooked on, your kids get hooked on drugs or walk away from God, the family, or you. Sometimes those you love don't recover from an illness. And sometimes even the church can and will let you down. And when things like that happen, for believers, it is a huge, just, uh, it's a, it's a huge punch in the gut. And many times it just leaves us walking away, shaking our heads, going, why? Why, God? Why? Why did this happen? Why do you allow these things to happen uh, in my life? Why doesn't God protect us? And what do we do when life doesn't turn out as we think it should? Truth is, every one of us have knocked down moments in life. If you do, I mean, you do, I do, and we all do. And as soon as a man or a woman of God goes down, all the demons of hell, uh, hell shout, another one bites the dust. Huh. But ultimately, the gospel is not about the knockdowns. It's about to come back. Somebody say amen. It's about to come back. Listen, friend, I don't like getting knocked down or around any more than anybody else here does. But sometimes, just sometimes, a good knockdown is okay as long as there's a great comeback story. Amen. Several years ago, I was in a study called Comeback Boys of the Bible that helped to answer many of the questions that we have about the disappointments of life. I shared a message following that. I pulled that out and dusted that off and redid it for today because there are some things that are on my heart with regard to this young man's story that we just baptized today and with regard to my own story and many of yours as well that I just wanted to share with you this morning about the disappointments of life and about the experiences that I felt as God touched my life through this study. And by the way, everything we're talking about today comes right out of the Bible. And so you're going to want to grab your outline because I'm going to give you some good notes today. It's on the back of your bulletin that you received on the way in this morning. Hey, it's good to be here. I've had a couple, three weeks off. I've had several people ask me, we said, well, pastor, you leaving the church? You leaving the church? Oh, my goodness, the preacher's leaving the church. One person said, I want to be on the pulpit committee. I don't know how that made me feel. Well, I can tell you this much. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. Not until God says I'm leaving. I I, I would love to be here, uh, God willing, for the next 20 or so years and, and finish what God is doing here because I see God's hand on this church and I see some great things happening here at New Life. But it is good to be back. I had three weeks off. I've got to learn how to decompress and... and uh, and kind of a downshift in my mind because although I was there, I was thinking about you guys as well. And uh, I missed you very much. But it's good to be back. And I'm just praying that maybe, maybe God will do something or say something this morning about a knockdown experience in your life. But I'm praying more than that, that God will talk to you more importantly about a comeback. Now, I don't know all the knockdowns that everybody has here today, but God does. And I'm not smart enough to know what everybody needs in their life at this moment of life. But I'll tell you what God is. So I'm praying as we look at the life of Joseph that you will allow God to speak into your life because God has a word for you today and God can speak in a very powerful way. And if you and I will listen, God will give us the very thing that we need uh, in our life at this moment. Now Joseph was a man who excelled at all against all odds. And he came back with purpose and power. Technically speaking, he did not have a, a, uh, uh, a personal failure per se. Most knockdowns happen when somebody has a personal failure of some kind. There's some kind of sin they've committed or been caught up in or they stepped over the line or disobeyed and dishonored God. But it wasn't that way with Joseph. He was faithful all the way through. Actually, God gave Joseph uh, two dreams for his life and God gives every one of us dreams for our life as well. It is the purpose for your life. It is the mission for your life. It is the reason that you're here. And Joseph had two. The first one, would be that someday he would rule and have authority and the other is that his brothers would bow down down, uh, down to him and what's amazing about this dream is that after Joseph God gave Joseph these dreams everything seemed to go south for him okay everything just went south everything went bad everything 
in his life for a season went against the dream. It was something like 23 years uh, before Joseph's dreams were fulfilled. And the challenge for Joseph was that there were going to be tests and trials uh, and experiences in life that he was going to have to go through. And the challenge for Joseph throughout a life full of trials, uh, as it is for you and I, is will you trust God in the tough times and will you be faithful wherever God has you? That's the point. There are six tests in life. And you and I are going to face them as well. But the first, but first you got to know this. That God was in all this, God was over all this, and God was working through this for Joseph's good. In fact, in Psalm 105, it actually tells us, uh, beginning of verse 1, uh, that God orchestrated the test and he was in charge of this whole thing with Joseph, working for Joseph's good. Let's take a look at it, beginning in verse 1, and then dropping down to verses 8 through 22. Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Now go down to verse 8. He always stands by his covenant. The commitment made to a thousand generations. This is the covenant he made with Abraham and the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree and to the people of Israel as a never-ending covenant. I will give you the land of Canaan as your special possession he said this when they were few in number and a tiny group of strangers in Canaan. They wandered from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another, yet God did not let anyone oppress them. He warned the kings on their behalf, do not touch my chosen people and do not hurt my prophets. He called for a famine on the land of Canaan, cutting off its food supply, and then he, being God, sent someone to Egypt ahead of them. This was Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with fetters. That means chains and shackles. Uh, he went as a slave. Uh, and they placed uh, in on his neck an iron collar. Until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. So God did this. God was in this. Then Pharaoh sent him and set him free. The ruler of the nation opened his prison door. And Joseph was put in charge of all the king's household. He became ruler over all the king's possessions. Uh, uh, he could instruct the king's aides as he pleased and teach the king's advisor. Point is, God was in this whole thing. He was in it, working through it, and using it for Joseph's good. Friend, your dreams uh, uh, will happen. The reason God has you here on life will happen. Maybe not as fast as you want it to be. And there may be some ups and downs uh, along the way. Life may be good for a while, but life can get bad for a while. In many cases, it sometimes gets ugly for a while. But the fact is, is that we cannot judge the whole thing until the whole thing is over. Somebody say amen. Okay? And in Joseph's case, it wasn't going to be over until God said it was over. But in spite of the knockdowns in his life, God had a greater plan. And God's plan will come to fruition as we'll see here in a second. God will make his dreams for Joseph's life happen. The test is to trust God and stay faithful uh, to the very end. Now, there are six tests or trials that Joseph experienced. And you and I, every one of us are going to experience those things in our life as well. And these things were knockdowns uh, for Joseph, no doubt, no doubt, and his dreams. Uh, truth is, all of us will face the same kind of things. Uh, uh, so these are huge in the way that we respond to these things in our life when we face these are huge uh, things for us there are six tests or six trials that all of us will face in life at some point in our life here's the first one number one the test of the tests themselves uh, you ever get to a point in life where you just you're just tired you're just tired of being tested you're just tired of all the stuff all the time okay You've got to get past that point where the test of the test themselves, all of us will come up against this. Point is, my friend, tests will be there. Tests will come. You know that, right? I hope you do. You're going to have tests in your life all throughout your life. You can expect it. The Bible said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, do not be surprised by the fiery ordeal at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So tests are not foreign to life, uh, they're a part of life, and they are going to happen. Tests are going to happen, it's a part of life. And when they come into our life, tests will do something. 
They will reveal character or a lack of it. But they will always tell what's on the inside of us at the time. But tests also produce something in us. Romans 5, verse 3 through 5. We can rejoice when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help to develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our our confident hope of salvation, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. I like how the English Standard Version uh, puts it. We rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. That's why James chapter 1, verse 1 through 2 says this. Consider pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, uh, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. He said, learn to see the trials of life. Through the eyes of Almighty God, the testing of your faith, folks, uh, produces endurance. So let it happen. Let it do its work. Let endurance and perseverance finish its work. So then you will become strong and, 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 and mature, lacking nothing. You see, the only way many times that you and I are going to become everything that God wants us to be is to be able to get through those trials and tribulations and tests in our life. For ultimately, tests do something in your life. They make us more like Jesus Christ as they refine us. It helps me to be a witness to the world as I'm faithful to those around me. And through and in every test we face, we can give honor and glory to God. That's what tests can do. But friend, everybody is going to be tested. Every great athlete is tested. They are. Every great person is tested. Every great Christian is tested. Every Christian will be tested. The question is, will you be faithful uh, through the test and trials of life? When I was 19 years old, I joined the Army. And I remember getting off the bus at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and being introduced to my new guidance counselor and mentor. He was a giant of a man with a bullhorn for a voice and flaming red hair, which I later came to believe was scorched from the fires of hell itself. His name was Drill Sergeant Butts. Very fitting, I might add, but do not make the mistake about laughing about it. Okay. He was Jewish. Why is that important? It's not. How do I know? Well, only because he insistently would tell us uh, uh, the story of Masada where his people, the Jews, committed suicide instead of surrendering to the enemy. And I was certain that that is exactly what he wanted us to do. He wanted to kill every one of us at some point. But here we were. 120 of us or so, out with this grandiose idea of becoming a GI. I remember one kid who stood out in the crowd. He was a heavy set kid named uh, uh, Mike. He was from Pennsylvania, and he and I were assigned to the same platoon of about 30 or so guys. We ran everywhere we went, and Drill Sergeant Butts renamed us all with names I cannot share. But you can imagine the challenges that we faced. The first month was a nightmare, only we never got to sleep long enough for it to be a dream. My buddy Mike struggled, as you could imagine, and the whole platoon suffered for it. Every time Mike fell out or fell behind, we all got punished. We all had to drop and do push-ups, and we were punished for it. The guys wanted to pull a blanket party on him and, and, and throw a blanket over him at night and beat him up. But uh, uh, when the lights went out, but I wouldn't let him do it. He wasn't the only one who struggled. PT was brutal. Guys were dropping out left and right. Athletic guys were just quitting. One kid cut his wrist so he could go home. One morning, the platoon, uh, 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 the whole company came out. We lined up for formation, and there was a guy on the, uh, sitting on the ledge of our barracks. He was about three stories tall, and he was threatening to jump off if they didn't let him out of the army. We never saw him after that. Don't know what happened. One of the hardest moments of boot camp in about 95 degrees in northern Kentucky. We were in our PT, uh, doing PT in our rucksacks and full gear to acclimate ourselves to the hot weather. Guys were dropping out and falling off in a ditch and puking their guts out and stuff. And here's Mike, who had lost 50 pounds by now. He's running at the back of the formation where he usually was. We're all thinking, oh, no, Mike's dropping next. Mike's dropping next, and the drill sergeant's going to drop us and smoke us, and we're going to be doing 100 push-ups and ruck gear and everything in 95-degree weather in Kentucky. 
And all of a sudden, the back of the formation is loud as I've ever heard anybody shout. Mike yells out, I'm still here! <laughs> it was a turning point for our platoon in an amazing moment. I still remember like I was like it was yesterday and I was still there. I'm still here. Oh, drill sergeant butts didn't know the brother could smile, but he broke out in a smile and we all cheered. Glory to God. You know what Mike was saying? Well, yeah, preacher, you just told us he was saying he was still there. Yeah, that's what he said, but do you know what he was really saying? What he meant when he said I'm still here? Is he was saying, I'm hurting as much as you are. And I've thought about quitting just like you have. And this isn't fun for me, just like it isn't any fun for you. But I want everybody to know that even though I may have been knocked down, the time of two, the tough times haven't knocked me out. And I'm still here. Somebody say, man, glory to God, I'm still here. And I'm staying here to finish this thing called life. Because I know God's going to work it out for my best and my good. And that's the point and the challenge of life. Joseph and all six of these tests said like Mike in boot camp, I'm still here. Because he trusted God. And he was faithful to God all the way through. And that's the test. Take your Bibles if you would and turn over to Genesis chapter 39. And we don't have time to go through all of Joseph's entire life because it encompasses several chapters. But we're going to hit the highlights this morning. Joseph shares his dream with his brothers. And do you know what they do? They hate him for it. In fact, they want to kill him. But they decide instead to sell him to slave traders. And he ends up in Egypt in a man named Potiphar's house. And here's the first test. Joseph? You were faithful as a favored son in an ideal environment with a father who protected you. Will you now be faithful in a hostile environment and in a situation beyond your control? You were faithful as a son. Will you now be faithful as a slave? And Joseph, like my buddy in boot camp, made the decision to stay in it and be faithful. It's amazing how many young people today go through life, raised in a Christian home, going to church. They're in a good environment. And then they go off to college or work or whatever they're going to do. And all of a sudden they're in a new place in a new environment with new temptations and all kinds of new things around them. All of a sudden they're living anything but a Christian life. Many men are faithful at home with their families. But you get them out on the road on a business trip and they start living anything but a godly life. A man can be honorable in a crowd with a bunch of people at church, but you get him at home alone with a computer in a private setting and all of a sudden he's unfaithful. The question is, will you be faithful anywhere and everywhere God has you? Joseph was faithful all the way to the end. You see, a faithful man or woman is faithful everywhere. You can change the circumstance, but God's man is going to be faithful. And the test is, will I be faithful anywhere and everywhere God leads me? Joseph was. In fact, Joseph was so faithful even as a slave that the Bible said Potiphar put him in charge of everything. Genesis 39 verse 6, Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, why would somebody do that with a slave? Why would you do that? It's because Potiphar recognized that there was something special about this guy. And do you know what else he recognized and acknowledged? And this was a pagan, by the way. This was an unbelieving Egyptian. This unbeliever acknowledged and recognized that there was something special about Joseph's God. Because look in verse 3 of, of Genesis 39. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph. And the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Why? Because Joseph remained faithful even when his dreams weren't coming through. In fact, for a season, folks, uh, things looked like they were going in the opposite direction. And everything in his life was moving in a direction that was not in the direction of his dreams. He was going down. I mean, he's no longer the favored son of anyone. And he is certainly not in a place or a position to become a ruler at that point. He's a slave uh, in a foreign place. But don't miss this. He stayed faithful. And in the midst of everything, he could say, you know what? No matter what's going on around me, I'm still here somebody say man i'm still here glory to god and i'm going to remain faithful to the end here's the second test that joseph faced you and i'll face it as well the test of the flesh in genesis 39 verse 6 and 7 so potiphar left everything he had in joseph's care 
With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Wow. What an opportunity for a slave. A beautiful woman presents herself to Joseph. And the test is, will you honor God and remain sexually pure, even when the temptation is in front of you? And it was, and in fact, it was a daily temptation. For verse 10 said, she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her and kept out of her way as much as possible. So it's deliberate, uh, and it's daily, and it's direct. She's going to him and inviting him to sleep with her every time she sees him. And Joseph could have easily thought to himself, you know what, I'm a young man with needs and urges just like everybody else. And I might be a slave, but I'm still... I'm still a human being, and I've never been with a woman, and I may not get a chance to do this again. So this here is my chance. He could have thought that. And he could have easily thought, you know what, I'm a long way from home and from my family and from my father. And so nobody is ever going to know that I've slept with this woman. Here's the question, men. What are you going to do when everything says go? She says, let's do this. His passions are saying, let's do this. All of the culture is saying, let's do this. And everybody thinks it's okay. What are you going to do when everything says go? I'll tell you what Joseph did. Joseph said, no, I'm not going to do this. And this was his reasoning in verse 8 and 9. Joseph refused stuff, uh, saying, look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He's held back nothing from me except you because you're his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. He said, if I do this, it will dishonor my master. And I certainly don't want to do that. And if I do this, it's going to dishonor you because you're his wife. And I don't want to dishonor you. And if I do this thing, it's going to dishonor myself and my own body. And I surely don't want to do that. And in verse 9, he said, if I do this thing, it will dishonor God. And he calls it a great sin against God. And he said, I am not going to dishonor my God. You could have asked everybody in that equation there at that moment. You could have asked Potiphar's wife, do you believe in Yahweh? And she would have said, well, of course not. You could have asked Potiphar, do you believe in Yahweh? And he would have said, of course not. I believe in the sun God and of Egypt's other gods. You could have asked anyone in Egypt, do you believe in Joseph's God and in his standards of right and wrong? And every one of them would have said, no, we do not follow that. We don't believe in that. But here's the point. Joseph stood up and said, I do. I believe in God and I will not sin against my God. It's interesting that Joseph calls it a wicked thing in verse 9. Now, obviously, immorality is wrong. But you do know in the short term there is great pleasure in it, don't you? There is. However, in the long term, God said it's wicked. In the short term, it's a great opportunity. But in the long term, it's a great offense against God, yourself, and the other person you're doing it with. And Joseph said, I will not do this thing. It's what Daniel said in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, when he said, Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating food and wine given to him by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Uh, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. So he said, I don't want to do this. Here's what David said in Psalm 118, verse 9 through 11, when it said, how can a young man keep his way pure? He said, by guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I heard of a guy in a fellowship of Christian athletes banquet one time. He stood up and told everyone that he was a virgin. He was a big, about six foot six, strong, muscular, good looking football player. Had women chasing him like crazy. He stood up and told everybody, I'm a virgin. Not because he hadn't had the opportunity to have sex, he had. But because he decided that he was going to honor God, honor himself, and honor women in general by obeying God's commandments and standards. It is a test to the flesh, and it is a test that every one of us in this room will face at some point in our life. Because in today's promiscuous and unrestrained society, it is everywhere. There's great power when it comes to this kind of temptation, which in one sense is what makes it so overwhelming. But in the Holy Spirit... There is power and victory over temptation. And all God's people said, amen. The bottom line in my life, and I hope yours will be this. Uh, I want to be faithful all the way to the end. I want to honor God and honor my wife. So that on my deathbed, 
I can look at my wife and say, I may not have been perfect, but I was faithful and I honored you. I've been faithful. It's a test, and it's coming to your life if it hasn't come already. And when Joseph said, I won't do this, in essence, he was saying, Lord, life may be tough. It may be hard for me to walk away from this thing, but God, I'm still here, and you can count on me to be here. Amen. Here's the third test, the test of endurance. Here's what happens. Joseph does the right thing. He honors God. He says no to this woman. And do you know what the other woman does? She doesn't thank him for being a gentleman. No. She starts to spread lies on him. She tells lies about him and accuses him of doing something he didn't do. And he's going to end up in prison for doing the right thing. Look in verse 10 through 20 of Genesis 39. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her and kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. And Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand and ran from the house. When she saw that he was holding his cloak and after he had fled, she called out to his servant, her servants, uh, and soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. Uh, when he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. And she kept the cloak with her until her husband came home. And then she told him her story, too. Hebrew slave you brought into her house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his cloak with me. Potiphar was furious when he had heard his wife's story and about how Joseph had treated her. And so he took Joseph and threw him into prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there he remained. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is one thing to resist temptation and do the right thing and be rewarded for it. But it is another thing altogether to do the right thing and suffer for it. Amen? Every time Joseph was faithful, it appears like something bad happens. Why? Why did God allow this to happen when Joseph was doing the right thing? It was a test of endurance. Yes, Joseph was paying a price for doing the right thing. He was. He was. And there may be times in your life where that may happen to you as well. But I want to remind you of something. You'll pay an even bigger price if you get in the custom of doing the wrong thing. Amen? It'll be a bigger price. Joseph said, I don't understand why some of the things that are happening to me are happening to me right now. But you know what? I'm going to trust God no matter what. Even though my brothers have sold me into slavery. Even though this woman has falsely accused me and I'm sitting here in prison for it. I'm trusting God. No no matter where I am, in a pit, as a slave, or in prison, I'm going to be faithful all the way to the end. And the bottom line is, that is the test. Listen, God may be saying to you right now, we're going to get there, friend. We're going to get there. There'll be better days for you. This plan that I have for your life is going to happen. I'm going to get this thing done. Trust me, your dreams are going to be fulfilled. We are going to get there. But I'm going to take you there through a pit where I'm going to take you there as a slave where I might even let you go to prison. But in the end, I'm going to accomplish in you and through you things for your benefit and for my glory. And the point is, is that God is always at work doing something in you to get you to a place greater than where you're at right now. That's the bottom line. And so Joseph said, I'm trusting God and I'm going to stay faithful even when things don't seem right. Here's the fourth test of life. The test of doubt. Joseph's going to meet two guys in prison. One a butler, your translation may say a cupbearer, the second a baker. And they both have dreams. And he's going to interpret their dreams. And the dreams are such that he tells them this. Uh, in Genesis chapter 40 verse 18 through 22. This is what your dream means, Joseph told the baker. The three baskets represent three days. Three days from now, Pharaoh will lift you up and impale your body on a pole. Well, I'm sorry I asked you to read my dream. <laughs> then birds will come and peck away at your flesh. Pharaoh's birthday came three days later, and he prepared a banquet for all his officials and staff. He summoned his chief cupbearer and chief baker to join the other officials. He then restored the cupbearer to his former position so he again could hand Pharaoh his cup. But Pharaoh impelled the chief, impaled the chief baker just as Joseph had predicted when he interpreted the dream. So Joseph tells the baker, in three days you're going to die. Pharaoh's going to kill you. But Mr. Butler... 
in three days you're going to go back into Pharaoh's service. Uh, you're going to be rewarded. That was a dream, and that's what he interpreted. And what happened is those things came true. Now, here's a test for Joseph. The guy's dream came to fruition three days after he had the dream. And Joseph's sitting there thinking, I've been waiting 14 years for my dreams to happen, and nothing has happened. Nothing has changed for good in my life. And what? here's my question to you this morning. What do you do when God gives you a dream for your life and it hasn't happened? Answer, you keep trusting God. Somebody say amen. You keep trusting God. You keep faithful all the way to the end. Now, you don't have to live your life that way. You don't. You can do life your way. You can rebel against God if you want and live life your way. But the only way that you get the blessing of God, the peace of God, the presence of God, the purpose of God, and the power of God in your life is to do this thing called life God's way. I can't explain it. I don't always understand why things are the way they are when it's tough, especially when I'm in the equation. (laughs) Life's hard, and sometimes it's very messy, especially when I find myself in tough situations. Joseph was in prison. Now, I've never been in prison. I've worked in one, a jail, not really a prison, a jail though. I've worked in one, okay? But here's something I do know about prison because I've seen it firsthand. God can do some pretty incredible work in a man's life in prison, amen? God can turn some people around in prison. Jesus was in a pit for three days, and out of that, God brought the resurrection. The point is, God is always at work, and God is always doing something. Somebody give him praise. Amen. In John 21, verse 18 through 22, Jesus appeared to the disciples on the beach after the resurrection. And he tells Peter, you're going to suffer for me greatly. In essence, he tells him, he's going to die for Christ. I want you to listen to the exchange, verse 18 through 22 of John 21. He said, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Verse 19. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. And then Jesus, he was led to his death. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? John. Peter looks at John and asks Jesus, what about him, Lord? What's going to happen to him? And Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you as for you? You follow me. Jesus looks at Peter and said, don't worry about what's happening to everybody else. Don't worry about what's happening to John. You just follow and you trust me. Don't worry, friends, about what's happening to anybody else in your life. You just be faithful even if you have doubts about things. And that is life's test. The test is this. What will you do when things aren't working out? Will you stay faithful? When things don't go or things don't happen as you thought they would or should, will you be faithful? When certain things do happen that are hard to accept in your life, will you stay faithful? When nothing is happening and you don't know why, will you remain faithful? Will you keep trusting God? Just be faithful wherever you are. Joseph did, and he was able to say, Lord, I'm still Here, trust in God and be faithful all the way through. Here's the fifth test. The test of patience. Joseph faced this test too. Because he tells the butler, when you get back up there to Pharaoh, don't, don't forget me, tell him who I am because I'm in here unjustly. And guess what happens? The butler goes up there and in Genesis chapter 40 verse 23 it said, He forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. Wow. He forgets Joseph. And Joseph sits for two more years in prison, friend. The question is this. Lord, how long? How long is my life going to be like this? How long uh, am I going to be knocked down and suffer? How long am I going to have to go through all of this stuff? How long, God? David asked this same thing in his life. In Psalm 6-3, David said, I'm sick at heart. How long, God, until you restore me? Psalm 13-1, how long will you forgive me? Psalm 89-46, how long will this go on? Psalm 35-17, how long will you 
refuse to rescue me from attack. Psalm 93, uh, 13. Lord, how long uh, will you delay? Psalm 79, 5. How long will you be angry with me? Psalm 94, 3. How long, Lord, will you let the wicked people around me glow? How long, God, am I going to suffer? How long am I going to be in the desert? How long is all of this going to last in my life? And the answer for you today is this. As long as it takes. Somebody say amen. As long as it takes. God invented time. We invented watches. We're the ones who invented fast food and instant coffee. God didn't do that. We did. God's not cut like that. We're the ones who can't wait on anything. But the Bible said in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 that those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. Amen. You know the story. After all of this is done, Joseph at the end of his dreams, uh, he has them fulfilled. And at the end of all his dreams, he's going to become second in command of all of Egypt. God's going to give him a throne. And because of this, uh, uh, he's going to be able to save his family. That's exactly what happened. And he's going to honor his dad because of this. And he's going to save Israel because of this. And a result, uh, as a result of what Je Joseph did, remaining faithful in the face of adversity and test, uh, in the end, he, in fact, is one of the ones responsible for helping the seed of the Messiah to survive. And I believe uh, if you would have went back and asked Joseph, was it worth 23 years of your life? To see the plan of God fulfilled in you and through you, he would say yes, because here's what happened. In the end, his father was blessed, his brothers were blessed, his family was blessed, a nation was blessed, and God was blessed. Amen? I felt called to preach when I was 16 years old. Can you believe that? You realize the trouble I could have missed by running from that call or the rejection I could have been spared it hadn't always been easy it wasn't easy and there were times on my way to that dream when I wondered why God when is this even going to happen but here's my point what I'm doing today in one sense up here in this pulpit is a fulfillment of a dream that God gave me 42 years ago and the journey has been worth it how long did it take it took as long as God wanted him to take wanted it to take point is life is up to him it's up to him and your assignment and mine is simply this to trust God and be faithful however long it takes and to be able to say with Joseph I'm still here. Somebody say amen. Glory to God. Here's the last test. The test of courage. What's going to happen in a moment is Joseph's going to go from the prison to the palace. And as soon as God was ready for it to happen, the Bible calls it in the fullness of time. God can make whatever he wants to happen, happen in a heartbeat. He made Joseph, who had been forgotten, go from a place where he had been forgotten to number two in all of Egypt. Uh, here's how it went down. Pharaoh had some dreams. And he hears about this guy in prison who can interpret them. In verse 14 through 16, Genesis 41, Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once, and he quickly brought him from the prison. And after he shaved and changed his clothes, he went in and stood before Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh says to Joseph, I had a dream last night. And no one here can tell me what it means. But I have heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. And the test is this for Joseph. Now that you're elevated, young man, now that it's your shot, who are you going to give glory to? Are you going to accept the glory for yourself or are you going to give glory to God? And here's what Joseph did in verse 16. He said, it is beyond my power to do this. He tells the king, it's beyond my power. Joseph said, I can't interpret these dreams, but God can. God can tell you what it means, and God can set your mind at ease. Uh, it's like the athlete who after winning the Super Bowl, he's standing there on the platform, confetti's falling everywhere. A reporter sticks a mic in his face, and he says, tell us your thoughts. And the very first thing the young man says is, I want to give honor and glory glory to the my lord and savior jesus christ the test is am i gonna honor god with my life and the end result was joseph did he was faithful to the very end let me close with this story when neil jeffrey was little he'd always wanted to play in the nfl 
It was one of his dreams. He had two dreams as a kid. One was to quarterback in the National Football League, and the other was to be a preacher. After a successful college career at Baylor, he was drafted by the San Diego Chargers. His first year in the NFL, he didn't play much at all. His official stats were two for two for 18 yards. That was it. At the end of the year, he was released by the Chargers and wound up with the New York Giants. He's in training camp with the Giants, but there were seven other quarterbacks there as well, and so he didn't get any time. And he was struggling. And he said, I took two snaps in scrimmage the entire camp. But he discovered that there were cut guys on the way to breakfast one day because he'd been walking to breakfast and he saw assistant coaches coming up to people and it would come up to a guy and say, please come with me. And then you'd never see the guy again. And Neil said, I started to dread breakfast thinking I was going to be next. And so he said, I looked really, really hard to try to find another way to the dining hall. But eventually they found him and he walks into the head coach's office and the coach goes, Neil, I'm sorry, but you're not an NFL quarterback. You're not big enough or strong enough and you just don't fit the, uh, uh, you don't fit where we're going and we're going to move forward without you. Neil said immediately as a response, I started to try to defend myself saying, you know, I haven't even done anything here. You haven't even let me. But then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I just began to sob and cry like a baby. And he said, I was a stutterer on top of that. And all that means is I stutter. And he said, stuttering and crying is not a good thing. It's kind of ugly. And so the coach couldn't understand the thing I said. And I look up, and here he says I am in an NFL coach's, head coach's office crying like a baby. The coach was gracious. He reached out, shook my hand, and then walked out. He said, I cried all the way back to the dorm. I cried all the way to the airport. I cried all the way home thinking I'm a failure. I'm a failure. I failed. I blew it. Uh, I was thinking that my wife's going to think less of me and all the fans of Baylor who had watched me play over the years are going to read it in the paper and they're going to think he blew it. And he said the worst thing about failing is you start to think that everybody around you thinks you're a failure. But looking back, Neil said this. He said, I realized I wasn't a failure at all. And from God's perspective, I realized that even if that head coach didn't know it, what that coach had just said was, Neil, this is not God's plan for your life. I'm sending you to it. You're going to walk out of here to a brand new thing that God wants to do in your life. You're going to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friend, your life and my life is ultimately in God's hands. Somebody say, man, it's in God's hands. And the challenge for us is this. Are we going to be faithful and trust Jesus all the way through it? All the way to the end, regardless of where we're at. Never give up on your dream. Keep trusting God. Because God is always at work doing something in your life. And in the end, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. The bottom line is, God is getting me ready for something else. And it will come to pass. One last thing. As the band comes. Theologians have found, that, uh, found 101 things in the life of Joseph that typify Jesus Christ. Meaning there's 101 things that Joseph did just like Jesus Christ. And that's the assignment of our lives. To be faithful through everything for all of our life. And let people see a man or woman who represents and reflects Jesus by trusting him as Lord and Savior of their life. And being faithful wherever God takes us. And that is the message. And all of God's people said, amen. Bow your heads in prayer. Bow your heads in prayer, friend. I pray that the Spirit of God has said something to every man and woman and young person in this room today. And the challenge is this now. Are we going to trust Jesus? I don't have all the answers, friends, when it comes to life. Who of us does? But I do know this about you. You are trusting in something. Trust Jesus, who's Lord over everything. He's going to bring your dreams to pass and mine as, uh, to pass and mine as well. He'll make them happen. He's going to do something in my life and through my life. I know that, and that is why I'm trusting him, and that is why I'm going to remain faithful. And I pray that everyone in this room will make a commitment to be faithful to the very end. In Jesus' name, amen.
Stand and join us. The invitation's on the screen. The altar is open.